Chapter 1 of The Hill of Dreams by Arthur Mackin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. The Hill of Dreams. Chapter 1 there was a glow in the sky as if great furnace doors were opened. But all the afternoon his eyes had looked on glamour. He had strayed in fairyland. The holidays were nearly done, and Lucy and Taylor had gone out resolved to lose himself, to discover strange hills and prospects that he had never seen before. The air was still, breathless, exhausted after heavy rain, and the clouds looked as if they had been molded of lead. No breeze blew upon the hill, and down in the well of the valley not a dry leaf stirred, not a bough shook in all the dark January woods. About a mile from the rectory he had diverged from the main road by an opening that promised mystery and adventure. It was an old neglected lane, little more than a ditch, worn ten feet deep by its winter waters, and shadowed by great untrimmed hedges, densely woven together. On each side were turbid streams, and here and there a torrent of water gushed down the banks, flooding the lane. It was so deep and dark that he could not get a glimpse of the country through which he was passing, but the way went down and down to some unconjectured hollow. Perhaps he walked two miles between the high walls of the lane before its descent ceased, but he thrilled with the sense of having journeyed very far all the way from the known to the unknown. He had come, as it were, into the bottom of a bowl amongst the hills, and black wood shut out the world. From the road behind him, from the road before him, from the unseen wells beneath the trees, rivulets of waters swelled and streamed down towards the center, to the brook that crossed the lane. Amid the dead and wearied silence of the air, beneath leaden and motionless clouds, it was strange to hear such a tumult of gurgling and rushing water, and he stood for a while on the quivering footbridge, and watched the rush of dead wood and torn branches and wisps of straw all hurrying madly past him, to plunge into the heaped spume, the barmy froth that had gathered against a fallen tree. Then he climbed again, and went up between limestone rocks, higher and higher, till the noise of waters became indistinct, a faint humming of swarming hives in summer. He walked some distance on level ground, till there was a break in the banks and a stile on which he could lean and look out. He found himself, as he had hoped, afar and forlorn. He had strayed into outland and occult territory. From the eminence of the lane, skirting the brow of a hill, he looked down into deep valleys and dingles, and beyond, across the trees, to remoter country, wild bare hills and dark wooded lands meeting the grey still sky. Immediately beneath his feet the ground sloped steep down to the valley, a hillside of close grass patched with dead bracken, and dotted here and there with stunted thorns, and below there were deep oak woods, all still and silent and lonely, as if no one ever passed that way. The grass and bracken and thorns and woods all were brown and gray beneath the leaden sky, and as Lucien looked he was amazed, as though he were reading a wonderful story, the meaning of which was a little greater than his understanding. Then, like the hero of a fairy book, he went on and on catching now and again glimpses of the amazing country in which he had penetrated, and perceived rather than seeing that as the day waned everything grew more and more somber. As he advanced he heard the evening sounds of the farms, the low of the cattle and the barking of the sheepdogs, a faint thin noise from far away. It was growing late, and as the shadows blackened he walked faster, till once more the lane began to descend, there was a sharp turn, and he found himself, with a good deal of relief and a little disappointment, on familiar ground. He had nearly described a circle, 
and knew this end of the lane very well. It was not much more than a mile from home. He walked smartly down the hill. The air was all glimmering and indistinct, transmuting trees and hedges into ghostly shapes, and the walls of the White House farm flickered on the hillside, as if they were moving towards him. Then a change came. First, a little breath of wind brushed with a dry whispering sound through the hedges, the few leaves left on the boughs began to stir, and one or two danced madly, and as the wind freshened and came up from a new quarter, the sapless branches above rattled against one another like bones. The growing breeze seemed to clear the air and lighten it. He was passing the stile where a path led to old Mrs. Gibbon's desolate little cottage, in the middle of the fields, at some distance even from the lane and he saw the light blue smoke of her chimney rise distinct above the gaunt green-gauge trees, against a pale band that was broadening along the horizon. As he passed the stile with his head bent and his eyes on the ground, something white started out from the black shadow of the hedge, and in the strange twilight, now tinged with a flush from the west, a figure seemed to swim past him and disappear. For a moment, he wondered who it could be. The light was so flickering and unsteady, so unlike the real atmosphere of the day. When he recollected, it was only Annie Morgan, old Morgan's daughter at the White House. She was three years older than he, and it annoyed him to find that, though she was only fifteen, there had been a dreadful increase in her height since the summer holidays. He had got to the bottom of the hill, and, lifting up his eyes, saw the strange changes of the sky. The pale band had broadened into a clear, vast space of light, and above, the heavy leaden clouds were breaking apart and driving across the heaven before the wind. He stopped to watch, and looked up at the great mound that jutted out from the hills into mid-valley. It was a natural formation and always it must have had something of the form of a fort, but its steepness had been increased by Roman art, and there were high banks on the summit which Lucian's father had told him were the vallum of the camp, and a deep ditch had been dug to the north to sever it from the hillside. On this summit oaks had grown, queer, stunted-looking trees with twisted and contorted trunks, and writhing branches, and these now stood out black against the lighted sky. And then the air changed once more. The flush increased, and a spot like blood appeared in the pond by the gate, and all the clouds were touched with fiery spots and dapples of flame. Here and there it looked as if awful furnace doors were being opened. The wind blew wildly, and it came up through the woods with a noise like a scream and a great oak by the roadside ground its boughs together with a dismal grating jar. As the red gained in the sky, the earth and all upon it glowed. Even the gray winter fields and the bare hillsides crimsoned, the water pools were cisterns of molten brass, and the very road glittered. He was wonderstruck, almost aghast, before the scarlet magic of the afterglow. The old Roman fort was invested with fire, Flames from heaven were smitten about its walls, and above there was a dark floating cloud, like fume of smoke, and every haggard writhing tree showed as black as midnight against the black of the furnace. When he got home he heard his mother's voice calling, "'Here's Lucian at last. Mary, Master Lucian has come. You can get the tea ready.' He told a long tale of his adventures, and felt somewhat mortified when his father seemed perfectly acquainted with the whole course of the lane, and knew the names of the wild woods through which he had passed in awe. "'You must have gone by the Darren, I suppose.' That was all he said. "'Yes, I noticed the sunset. We shall have some starmy weather. I don't expect to see many in church tomorrow.' There was buttered toast for tea, because it was the holidays. The red curtains were drawn, and a bright fire was burning, and there was old familiar furniture, a little shabby, but charming from association. 
it was much pleasanter than the cold and squalid schoolroom, and much better to be reading Chambers' journal than learning Euclid, and better to talk to his father and mother than to be answering such remarks as, "'I say, Taylor, I've torn my trousers. How much do you charge for mending?' "'Lucy, dear, come quick and sew this button on my shirt.' That night the storm woke him, and he groped with his hands amongst the bedclothes and sat up, shuddering, not knowing where he was. He had seen himself in a dream, within the Roman fort, working some dark horror, and the furnace doors were opened, and a blast of flame from heaven was smitten upon him. Lucian went slowly, but not discreditably, up the school, gaining prizes now and again, and falling in love more and more with useless reading and unlikely knowledge. He did his elegics and iambics well enough, but he preferred exercising himself in the rhymed Latin of the Middle Ages. He liked history, but he loved to meditate on a land laid waste, Britain deserted by the legions, the rare pavements riven by frost, Celtic magic still brooding on the wild hills and in the black depths of the forest, the rosy marble stained with rain and the walls growing gray. The masters did not encourage these researches. A pure enthusiasm, they felt, should be for cricket and football. The dilettante might even play fives and read Shakespeare without blame, but healthy English boys should have nothing to do with decadent periods. He was once found guilty of recommending Villon to a schoolfellow named Barnes. Barnes tried to extract unpleasantness from the text during preparation and rioted in his place, owing to his incapacity for the language. The matter was a serious one. The headmaster had never heard of Villon, and the culprit gave up the name of his literary admirer without remorse. Hence sorrow for Lucian and complete immunity for the miserable, illiterate Barnes, who resolved to confine his researches to the Old Testament, a book which the headmaster knew well. As for Lucian, he plodded on, learning his work decently and sometimes doing very creditable Latin and Greek prose. His schoolfellows thought him quite mad and tolerated him, and indeed were very kind to him in their barbarous manner. He often remembered in after life acts of generosity and good nature done by wretches like Barnes, who had no care for old French nor for curious meters, and such recollections always moved him to emotion. Travelers tell such tales. Cast upon cruel shores amongst savage races, they have found no little kindness and warmth of hospitality. He looked forward to the holidays as joyfully as the rest of them. Barnes and his friend Duskett used to tell him their plans and anticipation. They were going home to brothers and sisters, and to cricket, more cricket, or to football, more football, and in the winter there were parties and jollities of all sorts. In return, he would announce his intention of studying the Hebrew language, or perhaps Provençal, with a walk up a bare and desolate mountain by way of open-air amusement, and on a rainy day for choice. Whereupon Barnes would impart to Duskett his confident belief that old Taylor was quite cracked. It was a queer, funny life, that of school, and so very unlike anything in Tom Brown. He once saw the headmaster patting the head of the bishop's little boy, while he called him my little man, and smiled hideously. He told the tale grotesquely in the lower fifth room the same day and earned much applause, but forfeited all liking directly by proposing a voluntary course of scholastic logic. One barbarian threw him to the ground and another jumped on him, but it was done very pleasantly. There were indeed some few of a worse class in the school, solemn sycophants, prigs perfected from tender years, who thought life already serious, and yet, as the headmaster said, were joyous, manly young fellows. Some of these dressed for dinner at home, and talked of dances when they came back in January. But this virulent sort was comparatively infrequent, and achieved great success in the after life. Taking his school days as a whole, he always spoke up for the system, and years afterward 
he described with enthusiasm the strong beer at a roadside tavern some way out of the town. But he always maintained that the taste for tobacco, acquired in early life, was the great life was the great note of the English public school. Three years after Lucian's discovery of the narrow lane and the vision of the flaming fort, the August holidays brought him home at a time of great heat. It was one of those memorable years of English weather, when some Provençal spell seems wreathed round the island in the northern sea, and the grasshoppers chirp loudly as the cicadas, the hills smell of rosemary, and white walls of the old farmhouses blaze in the sunlight as if they stood in Arles or Avignon or famed Terrasson by Rhone. Lucien's father was late at the station, and consequently Lucien bought the confessions of an English opium-eater which he saw on the bookstall. When his father did drive up, Lucien noticed that the old trap had had a new coat of dark paint, and that the pony looked advanced in years. "'I was afraid that I should be late, Lucien,' said his father though I made old Polly go like anything. I was just going to tell George to put her into the trap, when young Philip Harris came to me in a terrible state. He said his father fell down all of a sudden like, in the middle of the field, and they couldn't make him speak, and would I please to come and see him. So I had to go, though I couldn't do anything for the poor fellow. They had sent for Dr. Burroughs, and I'm afraid he will find it a bad case of sunstroke." The old people say they never remember such a heat before. The pony jogged steadily along the burning turnpike road, taking revenge for the hurrying on the way to the station. The hedges were white with the limestone dust, and the vapor of heat palpitated over the fields. Lucian showed his confessions to his father, and began to talk of the beautiful bits he had already found. Mr. Taylor knew the book well, had read it many years before. Indeed, he was almost as difficult to surprise as that character in Daudet, who had one formula for all the chances of life, and when he saw the drowned academician dragged out of the river, merely observed, J'avoue tout ça. Mr. Taylor the parson, as his parishioners called him, had read the fine books and loved the hills and woods, and now knew no more of pleasant or sensational surprises. Indeed, the living was much depreciated in value, and his own private means were reduced almost to vanishing point, and under such circumstances the great style loses many of its finer savors. He was very fond of Lucian, and cheered by his return, but in the evening he would be a sad man again, with his head resting on one hand and eyes reproaching sorry fortune. Nobody called out, Here's your master with Master Lucian, you can get tea ready, when the pony jogged up to the front door. His mother had been dead a year, and a cousin kept house. She was a respectable person called Deacon, of middle age and ordinary standards, and, consequently, there was cold mutton on the table. There was a cake, but nothing of flour, baked in ovens, would rise at Miss Deacon's avocation. Still, the meal was laid in the beloved parlor with the view of hills and valleys and climbing woods from the open window, and the old furniture was still pleasant to see, and the old books in the shelves had many memories. One of the most respected of the armchairs had become weak in the casters and had to be artfully propped up, but Lucian found it very comfortable after the hard forms. When tea was over, he went out and strolled in the garden and the orchards, and looked over the stile down into the break, where foxgloves and bracken and broom mingled with the hazel undergrowth, where he knew of secret glades and untracked recesses, deep in the woven green, the cabinets for many years of his lonely meditations. Every path about his home, every field and hedgerow, had dear and friendly memories for him, and the odor of the meadow sweet was better than the incense steaming in the sunshine. He loitered and hung over the stile till the far-off woods began to turn purple, till the white mists were wreathing in the valley. Day after day, through all that August, morning and evening were wrapped in haze. Day after day the earth shimmered in the heat, and the air was strange, unfamiliar. 
as he wandered in the lanes and sauntered by the cool sweet verge of the woods, he saw and felt that nothing was common or accustomed, for the sunlight transfigured the meadows and changed all the forms of the earth. Under the violent Provencal sun the elms and beeches looked exotic trees, and in the early morning, when the mists were thick, the hills had put on an unearthly shape. The one adventure of the holidays was the visit to the Roman fort, to that fantastic hill about whose steep bastions and haggard oaks he had seen the flames of sunset writhing nearly three years before. Ever since that Saturday evening in January, the lonely valley had been a desirable place to him. He had watched the green battlements in summer and winter weather, had seen the heaped mounds rising dimly amidst the drifting rain, had marked the violent height swim up from the ice-white bulwarks glimmer and vanish in hovering April twilight. In the hedge of the lane there was a gate on which he used to lean and look down south to where the hills surged up so suddenly, its summit defined on summer evenings not only by the rounded ramparts but by the ring of dense green foliage that marked the circle of oak trees. Higher up the lane, on the way he had come that Saturday afternoon, one could see the white walls of Morgan's farm on the hillside to the north, and on the south there was the stile with the view of old Mrs. Gibbon's cottage smoke. But down in the hollow, looking over the gate, there was no hint of human work, except those green and antique battlements on which the oak stood in circle, guarding the inner wood. The ring of the fort drew him with stronger fascination during that hot August weather. Standing, or as his headmaster would have said, mooning by the gate, and looking into that enclosed and secret valley, it seemed to his fancy as if there were a halo about the hill, an aureole that played like flame around it. One afternoon, as he gazed from his station by the gate, the sheer sides and the swelling bulwarks were more than ever things of enchantment. The green oak ring stood out against the hill, as still and bright as in a picture, and Lucian, in spite of his respect for the law of trespass, slid over the gate. The farmers and their men were busy on the uplands with the harvest, and the adventure was irresistible. At first he stole along by the brook in the shadow of the alders, where the grass and the flowers of wet meadows grew richly. But as he drew nearer to the fort, and its height now rose sheer above him, he left all shelter and began desperately to mount. There was not a breath of wind. The sunlight shone down on the bare hillside. The loud chirp of the grasshoppers was the only sound. It was a steep ascent and grew steeper as the valley sank away. He turned for a moment and looked down towards the stream, which now seemed to wind remote between the alders. Above the valley there were small dark figures moving in the cornfield, and now and again there came the faint echo of a high-pitched voice singing through the air as on a wire. He was wet with heat. The sweat streamed off his face, and he could feel it trickling all over his body. But above him the green bastions rose defiant, and the dark ring of oaks promised coolness. He pressed on and higher and at last began to crawl up the vallum, on hands and knees, grasping the turf and here and there the roots that had burst through the red earth. And then he lay panting with deep breaths on the summit. Within the fort it was all dusky and cool and hollow. It was as if one stood at the bottom of a great cup. Within the wall seemed higher than without, and the ring of oaks curved up like a dark green vault. There were nettles growing thick and rank in the fosse. They looked different from the common nettles in the lanes, and Lucian, letting his hand touch a leaf by accident, felt the sting burn like fire. Beyond the ditch there was an undergrowth, a dense thicket of trees, stunted and old, crooked and withered by the winds into awkward and ugly forms. Beech and oak and hazel and ash and yew twisted and so shortened and deformed that each seemed like the nettle of no common kind. He began to fight his way through the ugly growth, stumbling and getting hard knocks from the rebound of twisted boughs. His foot struck once or twice against something harder than wood, 
and looking down, he saw stones white with the leprosy of age, but still showing the work of the axe. And farther, the roots of the stunted trees gripped the foot-high relics of a wall, and a round heap of fallen stones nourished rank, unknown herbs that smelt poisonous. The earth was black and unctuous, and bubbling under the feet left no track behind. From it, in the darkest places where the shadow was thickest, swelled the growth of an abominable fungus, making the still air sick with its corrupt odor, and he shuddered as he felt the horrible thing pulped beneath his feet. Then there was a gleam of sunlight, and as he thrust the last boughs apart he stumbled into the open space in the heart of the camp. It was a lawn of sweet close turf in the center of the matted break, of clean firm earth from which no shameful growth sprouted, and near the middle of the glade was a stump of a felled yew-tree, left untrimmed by the woodman. Lucian thought it must have been made for a seat. A crooked bough through which a little sap still ran was a support for the back, and he sat down and rested after his toil. It was not really so comfortable a seat as one of the school forms, but the satisfaction was to find anything at all that would serve for a chair. He sat there, still panting after the climb and his struggle through the dank and jungle-like thicket, and felt as if he were growing hotter and hotter. The sting of the nettle was burning his hand, and the tingling fire seemed to spread all over his body. Suddenly he knew that he was alone not merely solitary, that he had often been amongst the woods and deep in the lanes, but now it was a wholly different and a very strange sensation. He thought of the valley winding far below him, all its fields by the brook green and peaceful and still, without path or track. Then he had climbed the abrupt surge of the hill, and passing the green and swelling battlements, the ring of oaks and the matted thicket, had come to the central space. And behind there were, he knew, many desolate fields, wild as common, untrodden, unvisited. He was utterly alone. He still grew hotter as he sat on the stump, and at last lay down at full length on the soft grass, and more at his ease felt the waves of heat pass over his body. And then he began to dream to let his fancy stray over half-imagined, delicious things, indulging a virgin mind in its wanderings. The hot air seemed to beat upon him in palpable waves, and the nettle-sting tingled and itched intolerably, and he was alone upon the fairy hill, within the great mounds, within the ring of oaks, deep in the heart of the matted thicket. Slowly and timidly he began to untie his boots, fumbling with the laces, and glancing all the while on every side at the ugly, misshapen trees that hedged the lawn. Not a branch was straight, not one was free, but all were interlaced and grew one about another, and just above the ground, where the cankered stems joined the protuberant roots, there were forms that imitated the human shape, and faces and twining limbs that amazed him. Green mosses were hair, and tresses were stark in gray lichen. A twisted root swelled into a limb. In the hollows of the rotted bark he saw the masks of men. His eyes were fixed and fascinated by the simulacra of the wood, and could not see his hands, and so at last, and suddenly it seemed, he lay in the sunlight, beautiful with his olive skin, dark-haired, dark-eyed, the glooming bodily vision of a strayed fawn. Quick flames now quivered in the substance of his nerves, hints of mysteries, secrets of life passed trembling through his brain, unknown desire stung him. As he gazed across the turf and into the thicket, the sunshine seemed really to become green, and the contrast between the bright glow poured on the lawn and the black shadow of the break made an odd flickering light, in which all the grotesque postures of stem and root began to stir the wood was alive. The turf beneath him heaved and sank as with the deep swell of the sea. He fell asleep and lay still on the grass in the midst of the thicket. 
he found out afterwards that he must have slept for nearly an hour. The shadows had changed when he awoke. His senses came to him with a sudden shock, and he sat up and stared at his bare limbs in stupid amazement. He huddled on his clothes and laced his boots, wondering what folly had beset him. Then, while he stood indecisive, hesitating, his brain a whirl of puzzled thought, his body trembling, his hands shaking, as with electric heat, sudden remembrance possessed him. A flaming blush shone red on his cheeks and glowed and thrilled through his limbs. As he awoke, a brief and slight breeze had stirred in a nook of the matted boughs and there was a glinting that might have been the flash of sudden sunlight across shadow, and the branches rustled and murmured for a moment, perhaps at the wind's passage. He stretched out his hands and cried to his visitant to return. He entreated the dark eyes that had shone over him and the scarlet lips that had kissed him. And then panic fear rushed into his heart and he ran blindly, dashing through the wood. He climbed the vallum and looked out, crouching, lest anybody should see him. Only the shadows were changed and a breath of cooler air mounted from the brook. The fields were still and peaceful, the black figures moved, far away amidst the corn and the faint echo of the high-pitched voices sang thin and distant on the evening wind. Across the stream, in the cleft on the hill opposite to the fort, the blue wood smoke stole up a spiral pillar from the chimney of old Mrs. Gibbon's cottage. He began to run full tilt down the steep surge of the hill, and never stopped till he was over the gate and in the lane again. As he looked back, down the valley to the south, he saw the violent ascent, the green swelling bulwarks, and the dark ring of oaks. The sunlight seemed to play about the fort with an aureole of flame. "'Where on earth have you been all this time, Lucian?' said his cousin when he got home. "'Why, you look quite ill. It is really madness of you to go walking in such weather as this. I wonder you haven't got a sunstroke, and the tea must be nearly cold.' I couldn't keep your father waiting, you know. He muttered something about being rather tired and sat down to his tea. It was not cold, for the cozy had been put over the pot, but it was black and bitter strong, as his cousin expressed it. The draft was unpalatable, but it did him good, and the thought came with great consolation that he had only been asleep and dreaming queer, nightmarish dreams. He shook off all his fancies with resolution, and thought the loneliness of the camp and the burning sunlight and possibly the nettle sting, which still tingled most abominably, must have been the only factors in his farrago of impossible recollections. He remembered that when he had felt the sting he had seized a nettle with thick folds of his handkerchief, and having twisted off a good length and put it in his pocket to show his father. Mr. Taylor was almost interested when he came in from his evening stroll about the garden and saw the specimen. "'Where did you manage to come across that, Lucian?' he said. "'You haven't been to Carmen, have you?' "'No. I got it from the Roman fort by the common.' "'Oh, the twine. You must have been trespassing, then. Do you know what it is?' "'No. I thought it looked different from the common nettles.' "'Yes. It's a Roman nettle. Arctic pilellifera. It's a rare plant. Burroughs says it's to be found at Caraman, but I was never able to come across it. I must add it to the flora of the parish. Mr. Taylor had begun to compile a flora accompanied by a hortus siccus, but both stayed on high shelves, dusty and fragmentary. He put the specimen on his desk, intending to fasten it in the book, but the maid swept it away, dry and withered, in a day or two. Lucian tossed and cried out in his sleep that night and the awakening in the morning was, in a measure, a renewal of the awakening in the fort. But the impression was not so strong, and in a plain room it seemed all delirium, a phantasmagoria. He had to go down to Carmen in the afternoon, for Mrs. Dixon, the vicar's wife, had commanded his presence at tea. Mr. Dixon, though fat and short and clean-shaven, ruddy of face, was a safe man, with no extreme views on anything. 
He deplored all extreme party convictions, and thought the great needs of our beloved Church were conciliation, moderation, and above all, amalgamation, so he pronounced the word. Mrs. Dixon was tall, imposing, splendid, well fitted for the Episcopal order, with gifts that would have shone at the palace. There were daughters who studied German literature, and thought Miss Frances Ridley Havergal wrote poetry but Lucian had no fear of them. He dreaded the boys. Everybody said they were such fine, manly fellows, such gentlemanly boys, with such a good manner, sure to get on in the world. Lucian had said, Bother! in a very violent manner when the gracious invitation was conveyed to him, but there was no getting out of it. Miss Deacon did her best to make him look smart. His ties were all so disgraceful that she had to supply the want with a narrow ribbon of sky-blue tint. And she brushed him so long and so violently that he quite understood why a horse sometimes bites and sometimes kicks the groom. He set out between two and three in a gloomy frame of mind. He knew too well what spending the afternoon with honest, manly boys meant. He found the reality more lurid than his anticipation. The boys were in the field, and the first remark he heard when he got in sight of the group was, "'Hello, Lucian! How much for the tie?' "'Fine tie!' another, a stranger, observed. "'You bagged it from the kitten, didn't you?' Then they made up a game of cricket, and he was put in first. He was LBW in his second over, so they all said, and had to field for the rest of the afternoon. Arthur Dixon, who was about his own age, forgetting all the laws of hospitality, told him he was a beastly muff when he missed a catch, rather a difficult catch. He missed several catches, and it seemed as if he were always panting after balls, which, as Edward Dixon said, any fool, even a baby, could have stopped. At last the game broke up, solely from Lucian's lack of skill, as everybody declared. Edward Dixon, who was thirteen, had a swollen red face and a projecting eye, wanted to fight him for spoiling the game, and the others agreed that he funked the right in a rather dirty manner. The strange boy, who was called Dacardi, and was understood to be faintly related to Lord Dacardi of McCarthy Town, said openly that the fellows at his place wouldn't stand such a sneak for five minutes. So the afternoon passed off very pleasantly indeed till it was time to go into the vicarage for weak tea, homemade cake, and unripe plums. He got away at last. As he went out the gate, he heard Dacardi's final observation. "'We like to dress well at our place. His governor must be beastly poor to let him go about like that. Do you see his trousers are all ragged at heel? Is old Taylor a gentleman?' It had been a very gentlemanly afternoon, but there was a certain relief when the vicarage was far behind, and the evening smoke of the little town, once the glorious capital of Siluria, hung haze-like over the ragged roofs and mingled with the river mist. He looked down from the height of the road on the huddled houses, saw the points of light start out suddenly from the cottages on the hillside beyond, and gazed at the long, lovely valley fading in the twilight till the darkness came and all that remained was the somber ridge of the forest. The way was pleasant through the solemn-scented lane, with glimpses of dim country, the vague mystery of night overshadowing the woods and meadows. A warm wind blew gusts of odor from the meadow sweet by the brook. Now and then bee and beetle span homeward through the air, booming a deep note as from a great organ far away, and from the verge of the wood came the Woo-hoo, woo-hoo, woo-hoo of the owls, a wild, strange sound that mingled with the whirr and rattle of the night jar deep in the bracken. The moon swam up through the films of misty cloud and hung, a golden, glorious lantern, in mid-air. And, set in the dusky hedge, the little green fires of the glow-worms appeared. He sauntered slowly up the lane, drinking in the religion of the scene and thinking the country by night as mystic and wonderful as a dimly lit cathedral. He had quite forgotten the manly young fellows and their sports, and only wished as the land began to shimmer and gleam in the moonlight that he knew by some medium of words or color 
how to represent the loveliness about his way. "'Had a pleasant evening, Lucian?' said his father when he came in. "'Yes, I had a nice walk home. Oh, in the afternoon we played cricket. I didn't care for it much. There was a boy named Descarty there. He is staying with the Dixons.' Mrs. Dixon whispered to me when we were going in to tea, he's a second cousin of Lord de Carty's, and she looked quite grave, as if she were in church. The parson grinned grimly and lit his old pipe. Baron de Carty's great-grandfather was a Dublin attorney, he remarked, which his name was Jeremiah McCarthy. His prejudiced fellow citizens called him the unjust steward, also the bloody attorney, and I believe that to hell with McCarthy was quite a popular cry about the time of the Union. Mr. Taylor was a man of very wide, in irregular reading, and a tenacious memory. He often used to wonder why he had not risen in the church. He had once told Mr. Dixon a singular and anecdote concerning the bishop's college days and he never discovered why the prelate did not bow according to his custom when the name of Taylor was called at the next visitation. Some people said the reason was lighted candles, but that was impossible, as the Reverend and Honorable Smallwood Stafford, Lord Bemis's son, who had a cure of souls in the cathedral city, was well known to burn no end of candles, and with him the bishop was on the best of terms. Indeed, the bishop often stayed at Copsey Hall, Lord Bemis's place in the West. Lucian had mentioned the name of Descarty with intention, and had perhaps exaggerated a little Mrs. Dixon's respectful manner. He knew such incidents cheered his father, who could never look at these subjects from a proper point of view, and, as people said, sometimes made the strangest remarks for a clergyman. This irreverent way of treating serious things was one of the great bonds between father and son, but it tended to increase their isolation. People said they would often have liked to ask Mr. Taylor to garden parties and tea parties and other cheap entertainments, if only he had not been such an extreme man and so queer. Indeed, a year before, Mr. Taylor had gone to a garden party at the Castle Carmen, and had made such fun of the bishop's recent address on missions to the Portuguese that the Gervases and Dixons and all who heard him were quite shocked and annoyed. And, as Mrs. Myrick of Len Raven observed, his black coat was perfectly green with age. So on the whole, the Gervases did not like to invite Mr. Taylor again. As for the son, nobody cared to have him. Mrs. Dixon, as she said to her husband, really asked him out of charity. "'I'm afraid he seldom gets a real meal at home,' she remarked, "'so I thought he would enjoy a good wholesome tea for once in a way. But he is such an unsatisfactory boy, he would only have one slice of that nice plain cake, and I couldn't get him to take more than two plums. They were really quite ripe, too, and boys are usually so fond of fruit.' Thus Lucian was forced to spend his holidays chiefly in his own company, and make the best he could of the ripe peaches on the south wall of the rectory garden. There was a certain corner where the heat of that hot August seemed concentrated, reverberated from one wall to the other, and here he liked to linger of mornings when the mists were still thick in the valleys, mooning, meditating, extending his walk from the quince to the medlar and back again beside the moldering walls of mellowed brick. He was full of a certain wonder and awe, not unmixed with a swell of strange exultation, and wished more and more to be alone, to think over that wonderful afternoon within the fort. In spite of himself, the impression was fading. He could not understand that feeling of mad panic terror that drove him through the thicket and down the steep hillside. Yet he had experienced so clearly the physical shame and reluctance of the flesh. He recollected that for a few seconds after his awakening the sight of his own body had made him shudder and writhe, as if it had suffered some profoundest degradation. He saw before him a vision of two forms. A fawn with tingling and prickling flesh lay expectant in the sunlight and there was also the likeness of a miserable, shamed boy, 
standing with trembling body and shaking, unsteady hands. It was all confused, a procession of blurred images, now of rapture and ecstasy, and now of terror and shame, floating in a light that was altogether phantasmal and unreal. He dared not approach the fort again. He lingered in the road to Carmen that passed behind it, but a mile away and separated by the wild land and a strip of wood from the towering battlements. Here he was looking over a gate one day, doubtful and wondering, when he heard a heavy step behind him, and glanced round quickly saw it was old Morgan of the White House. "'Good afternoon, Master Lucian,' he began. "'Mr. Taylor pretty well, I suppose. I be going to the house a minute.' The men in the fields are wanting some more cider. Would you come and taste a drop of cider, Master Lucian? It's very good, sir, indeed. Lucian did not want any cider, but he thought it would please old Morgan if he took some, so he said he should like to taste the cider very much indeed. Morgan was a sturdy, thick-set old man of the ancient stock, a stiff churchman who breakfasted regularly on fat broth and carefully cheese in the fashion of his ancestors. Hot spiced elder wine was for winter nights and gin for festal seasons. The farm had always been the freehold of the family, and when Lucian, in the wake of the yeoman, passed through the deep porch by the oaken door down into the long dark kitchen, he felt as though the seventeenth century still lingered on. One mullioned window, set deep in the sloping wall, gave all the light there was through quarries of thick glass in which there were whirls and circles, so that the lapping rose branch and the garden and the fields beyond were distorted to the sight. Two heavy beams, oaken but whitewashed, ran across the ceiling. A little glow of fire sparkled in the great fireplace, and a curl of blue smoke fled up the cavern of the chimney. Here was the genuine chimney-corner of our fathers. There were seats on each side of the fireplace where one could sit snug and sheltered on December nights, warm and merry in the blazing light, and listen to the battle of the storm, and hear the flames spit and hiss at the falling snowflakes. At the back of the fire were great blackened tiles with raised initials and a date, I am 1684. "'Sit down, Master Lucian, sit down, sir,' said Morgan. "'Annie,' he called through one of the numerous doors, "'here's Master Lucian, the parson, would like a drop of cider. Fetch a jug, will you, directly?' "'Very well, father,' came the voice from the dairy, and presently the girl entered, wiping the jug she held. In his boyish way Lucian had been a good deal disturbed by Annie Morgan, he could see her on Sundays from his seat in church, and her skin, curiously pale, her lips that seemed as though they were stained with some brilliant pigment. Her black hair and the quivering black eyes gave him odd fancies which he had hardly shaped to himself. Annie had grown into a woman in three years, and he was still a boy. She came into the kitchen, curtsying and smiling. "'Good day, Master Lucian. And how is Mr. Taylor, sir?' "'Pretty well, thank you. I hope you are well.' "'Nicely, sir, thank you. How nice your voice do sound in church, Master Lucian, to be sure. I was telling father about it last Sunday.' Lucian grinned and felt uncomfortable, and the girl set down the jug on the round table and brought a glass from the dresser. She bent close over him as she poured out the green oily cider— fragrant of the orchard. Her hand touched his shoulder for a moment, and she said, I beg your pardon, sir, very prettily. He looked up eagerly at her face. The black eyes, a little oval in shape, were shining, and the lips smiled. Annie wore a plain dress of some black stuff, open at the throat. Her skin was beautiful. For a moment, the ghost of a fancy hovered unsubstantial in his mind. And then Annie curtsied as she handed him the cider and replied to his thanks with, "'And welcome kindly, sir.' The drink was really good, not thin nor sweet, but round and full and generous, with a fine yellow flame twinkling through the green when one held it up to the light. 
It was like a stray sunbeam hovering on the grass in a deep orchard, and he swallowed the glassful with relish and had some more, warmly commending it. Mr. Morgan was touched. "'I say you know a good thing, sir,' he said. He "'Is indeed now. It's good stuff, though it's my own making. My old grandfather, he planted the trees in the time of the wars, and he was a very good judge of an apple in his day and generation. And a famous grafter he was, to be sure. You will never see no swelling in the trees he grafted at all whatever. Now, there's James Morris, Pennyroll. He's a famous grafter, too. And yet, them red streaks he grafted for me five year ago, they be all swollen-like below the graft already. Would you like to taste a blemin' pippin' now, Master Lucian? There be a few left in the loft, I believe. Lucian said he should like an apple very much, and the farmer went out by another door, and Annie stayed in the kitchen talking. She said Mrs. Trevor, her married sister, was coming to them soon to spend a few days. "'She's got such a beautiful baby,' said Annie. "'And he's quite sensible-like already, though he's only nine months old. Mary would like to see you, sir, if you would be so kind as to step in. That is, if it's not troubling you at all, Master Lucian. I suppose you must be getting a fine scholar now, sir.' "'I am doing pretty well, thank you,' said the boy. I was first in my form last term. Fancy to think of that. Do you hear, father? What a scholar Master Lucian be getting. He be a rare grammarian, I'm sure, said the farmer. You do take after your father, sir. I always do say that nobody have got such a good deliverance in the pulpit. Lucian did not find the Blenheim orange as good as the cider, but he ate it with all the appearance of relish and put another, with thanks, in his pocket. He thanked the farmer again when he got up to go, and Annie curtsied and smiled and wished him good day and welcome kindly. Lucian heard her saying to her father as he went out what a nice-mannered young gentleman he was getting to be sure, and he went on his way thinking that Annie was really very pretty, and speculating as to whether he would have the courage to kiss her if they met in a dark lane. He was quite sure she would only laugh and say, Oh, Master Lucian! For many months he had occasional fits of recollection, both cold and hot, but the bridge of time, gradually lengthening, made those dreadful and delicious images grow more and more indistinct, till at last they all passed into that wonderland which a youth looks back upon in amazement not knowing why this used to be a symbol of terror or that of joy. At the end of each term he would come home and find his father a little more despondent, and harder to cheer even for a moment, and the wallpaper and the furniture grew more and more dingy and shabby. The two cats, gloved and ancient beasts, that he remembered when he was quite a little boy before he went to school, died miserably one after the other. Old Polly, the pony, at last fell down in the stable from the weakness of old age, and had to be killed there. The battered old trap ran no longer along the well-remembered lanes. There was long meadow grass on the lawn, and the trained fruit trees on the wall had got quite out of hand. At last, when Lucian was seventeen, his father was obliged to take him from school. He could no longer afford the fees. This was the sorry ending of many hopes, and dreams of a double first, a fellowship, distinction, and glory that the poor parson had long entertained for his son. And the two moped together in the shabby room, one on each side of the sulky fire, thinking of dead days and finished plans, and seeing a gray future in the years that advanced towards them. At one time there seemed some chance of a distant relative coming forward to Lucian's assistance, and indeed it was quite settled that he should go up to London with certain definite aims. Mr. Taylor told the good news to his acquaintances. His coat was too green now for any pretense of friendship. And Lucian himself spoke of his plans to Burroughs, the doctor, and Mr. Dixon, and one or two others. Then the whole scheme fell through and the parson and his son suffered much sympathy. 
People, of course, had to say they were sorry. But in reality, the news was received with high spirits. With the joy with which one sees a stone, as it rolls down a steep place, give yet another bounding leap towards the pool beneath. Mrs. Dixon heard the pleasant tidings from Mrs. Colley, who came in to talk about the mother's meeting and the band of hope. Mrs. Dixon was nursing little Athelwig, or some such name at the time, and made many affecting observations on the general righteousness with which the world was governed. Indeed, poor Lucian's disappointment seemed distinctly to increase her faith in the divine order, as if it had been some example in Butler's analogy. "'Aren't Mr. Taylor's views very extreme?' she said to her husband the same evening. "'I'm afraid they are.' he replied. I was quite grieved at the last diocesan conference at the way in which he spoke. The dear old bishop had given an address on auricular confession. He was forced to do so, you know, after what had happened, and I must say that I never felt prouder of our beloved church. Mr. Dixon told all the Homeric story of the conference, reciting the achievements of the champions, deploring this and applauding that. It seemed that Mr. Taylor had had the audacity to quote authorities which the bishop could not very well repudiate, though they were directly opposed to the safe episcopal pronouncement. Mrs. Dixon, of course, was grieved. It was sad to think of a clergyman behaving so shamefully. "'But you know, dear,' she proceeded, "'I have been thinking about that unfortunate Taylor boy and his disappointments, and after what you've just told me, I am sure it's some kind of judgment on them both. Has Mr. Taylor forgotten the vows he took at his ordination? But don't you think, dear, I am right, and that he has been punished? The sins of the fathers? Somehow or other Lucian divined the atmosphere of threatenings and judgments, and shrank more and more from the small society of the countryside. For his part, when he was not mooning in the beloved fields and woods of happy memory, he shut himself up with books, reading whatever could be found on the shelves, and amassing a store of incongruous and obsolete knowledge. Long did he linger with the men of the seventeenth century, delaying the gay sunlit streets with Pepys and listening to the charmed sound of the Restoration Revel, roaming by peaceful streams with Isaac Walton and the great Catholic divines, enchanted with the portrait of Herbert the loving ascetic, awed by the mystic breath of Crashaw. Then the cavalier poets sang their gallant songs, and Herrick made Dean Pryor magic ground by the holy incantation of a verse. And in the old proverbs and homely sayings of the time he found the good and beautiful English life, a time full of grace and dignity and rich merriment. He dived deeper and deeper into his books. He had taken all obsolescence to be his province. In his disgust at the stupid usual questions, will it pay, what good is it, and so forth, he would only read what was uncouth and useless. The strange pomp and symbolism of the Kabbalah, with its hint of more terrible things. The Rosicrucian mysteries of Flood, the enigmas of Vaughan, the dreams of alchemists, all these were his delight. Such were his companions, with the hills and hanging woods, the brooks and lonely water-pools. Books, the thoughts of books, the stirrings of imagination, all fused into one fantasy by the magic of the outland country. He held himself aloof from the walls of the fort. He was content to see the heaped mounds, the violent height with fairy bulwarks, from the gate in the lane and to leave all within the ring of oaks in the mystery of his boyhood's vision. He professed to laugh at himself and at his fancies of that hot August afternoon when sleep came to him within the thicket, but in his heart of hearts there was something that never faded, something that glowed like the red glint of a gypsy's fire seen from afar across the hills and mists of the night, and known to be burning in a wild land. Sometimes, when he was sunken in his books, the flame of delight shot up, and showed him a whole province and continent of his nature, all shining and aglow. 
and in the midst of the exultation and triumph he would draw back, a little afraid. He had become ascetic in his studious and melancholy isolation, and the vision of such ecstasies frightened him. He began to write a little, at first very tentatively and feebly, and then with more confidence. He showed some of his verses to his father, who told him with a sigh that he had once hoped to write in the old days at Oxford, he added. "'They are very nicely done,' said the parson, "'but I'm afraid you won't find anybody to print them, my boy.' So he pottered on, reading everything, imitating what struck his fancy, attempting the effect of the classic meters in English verse, trying his hand at a mask, a restoration comedy, forming impossible plans for books which rarely got beyond half a dozen lines on a sheet of paper, beset with splendid fancies which refused to abide before the pen. But the vain joy of conception was not altogether vain, for it gave him some armor about his heart. The months went by, monotonous, and sometimes blotted with despair. He wrote and planned and filled the waste-paper basket with hopeless efforts. Now and then he sent verses or prose articles to magazines, in pathetic ignorance of the trade. He felt the immense difficulty of the career of literature without clearly understanding it. The battle was happily in a mist, so that the host of the enemy, terribly arrayed, was to some extent hidden. Yet there was enough of difficulty to appall. From following the intricate course of little nameless brooks, from hushed twilight woods, from the vision of the mountains and the breath of the great wind, passing from deep to deep, he would come home filled with thoughts and emotions, mystic fancies which he yearned to translate into the written word. And the result of the effort seemed always to be bathos, wooden sentences, a portentous stilted style, obscurity and awkwardness clogged the pen. It seemed impossible to win the great secret of language. The stars glittered only in the darkness and vanished away in clearer light. The periods of despair were often long and heavy, the victories very few and trifling. Night after night he sat writing after his father had knocked out his last pipe, filling a page with difficulty in an hour and usually forced to thrust the stuff away in despair and go unhappily to bed conscious that after all his labor he had done nothing. And these were moments when the accustomed vision of the land alarmed him, and the wild domed hills and darkling woods seemed symbols of some terrible secret in the inner life of that stranger himself. Sometimes when he was deep in his books and papers, sometimes on a lonely walk, sometimes amidst the tiresome chatter of Caraman society, he would thrill with a sudden sense of awful hidden things, and there ran that quivering flame through his nerves that brought back the recollection of the matted thicket, and that earlier appearance of the bare black boughs enwrapped with flames. Indeed, though he avoided the solitary lane and the sight of the sheer height with its ring of oaks and molded mounds, the image of it grew more intense as the symbol of certain hints and suggestions. The exultant and insurgent flesh seemed to have its temple and castle within those olden walls, and he longed with all his heart to escape, to set himself free in the wilderness of London, and to be secure amidst the murmur of modern streets. End of chapter 1